um, move forward on a chartered public bank. Um, we have a six-month task, and we have been meeting for three months now, every three weeks, in open session. So while we welcome you here tonight, I do see some familiar faces who have joined us in uh, our open sessions, and we will continue to be meeting in open sessions. And so if you still have an interest in this matter, I would encourage you to um, uh, look for our open sessions and continue to attend. But we were required by our resolution, and we also thought it would be useful to have this public session um, dedicated specifically to a report to the community on the work that we've done to date and to give the community a chance to ask questions about that work and then to make such other comments uh, as may be useful to us in consideration what we're doing. Um, before I go any farther, though, I would like um, our task force to introduce itself to the audience. So if we could start at this end and then move forward, that would be good. Push the... Push the uh, I, I'm Kelly Huddleston. I'm an attorney in town. I'm Darla Brewer. I'm a, a financial analyst in t with the state of New Mexico. Elaine Sullivan. I'm one of the two community members on the task force. Uh, hi, my name is Judy Cormier. I'm a former bank executive for regulatory compliance, and I've been in Santa Fe for four years. My name is Randy Hippen. I'm a retired banker. Bob Mang, uh, also the com a community representative. Uh, my name is Brad Flitch. I'm the cash and investment officer for the city of Santa Fe. I'm here as uh, the finance director's designee. And my name is David Buckholz. I am the chair of the task force. I am a lawyer with the Rody Law Firm and have a expertise in government finance and um, government capital development. Um, so that's us. Um, let me speak a little bit about um, what we have done to date and the agenda and the ground rules for our meeting this afternoon. As I said, our um, facilitator, Michelle Liss, uh, took ill and is not with us, so I'm filling in for her on this, but I think we've got it pretty much down pat. As I said, the um, task force was formed by resolution of the council with the appointments made by the mayor and tasked to study um, the issue of public banking for the city of Santa Fe. Um, it was determined early on by the city attorney's office that the task force likely constituted a public body under the State Open Meetings Act. And so we have been meeting in full task force in open session uh, every three weeks since the um, end of August. Um, in order to accomplish our work, however, we thought it would be useful to break ourselves down into subcommittees. And we identified four subcommittees who will be reporting to you this evening. Um, those committees are subcommittees on legal matters, subcommittees on regulatory matters, subcommittees on capitalization matters, and finally, subcommittees on governance matters. Um, each one of those committees will present a report of their work to date tonight, followed by the opportunity for the audience to ask brief two-minute questions to those subcommittees on their topics. After that presentation is finished, there will be time for each member of the audience, if they like, to take several minutes. And I don't mean to filibuster us for hours, but I'm not going to put a strict time limit on the comments from members of the audience so that we could hear their thoughts on public banks and on the issues before us. Um, there are agendas in the back of the room, along with one extra piece to the um, slideshow that will be presented this evening on this. And on the agenda, you will find um, a question that our um, committee member, um, Ms. Sullivan, and uh, Mr. Mang developed in regard to the kind of things that we'd like you to be thinking of in regard to your comments at the end of the evening. Um, oh, Brad knows where they are. So unless anybody thinks that there's other for us to do as a matter of introduction, um, what I would ask is that the um, subcommittees um, begin to make their report. And um, I will make the first report on the legal subcommittee. Kelly and I participated in the organization of the legal subcommittee 
uh, but frankly, most of the work was um, accomplished through the auspices of the city attorney's office and by outside counsel that was hired um, by the city attorney um, in order to um, take a look at these issues. So I want to thank the city attorney for her offering her budget, and I also want to thank her for um, having the firm of um, Virtue and Najar, particularly Richard Virtue, and then his colleague, um, Mark Chaikin, um, study um, this issue for us. Um, they prepared a lengthy document um, that is part of the record. I'm not sure that we have um, topics here. I don't know that we have copies of that document here today, but they ought to be posted on web pages and otherwise available. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the legal subcommittee um, concluded that there are a number of challenges that would relate to um, legal questions regarding the creation and operation of a public bank, but that they did not come up with any particular challenge that they felt could not be either overcome or worked through uh, in order to cause the public, a public bank to be formed. That's not to minimize the seriousness of the challenges or the, um, the work and the expense that might have to take place in regard to a, uh, working through those challenges. Um, on our PowerPoints, we um, have several of those items identified. Um, they were identified originally by me in some legal work that I did early on um, in this matter when I was representing one of the groups that was associated with moving this forward and now followed through by Virtue and Najar. Um, the questions that they've studied included questions relating to home rule authority. Uh, to put that in layman's terms, there is no state statute that says a city can form a public bank. Uh, but there is state statutes that allow cities to undertake um, broader than statutorily created powers. Those are known as home rule powers. City of Santa Fe is a chartered home rule community and that gives them some leeway in regard to doing things that are beyond their statutory authorization. How those things work, what they may be, what are the limits of those are often a matter for debate and um, the question here ultimately would become is there anything under state law that would be read to say cities can't do this. And the study goes into an examination of the case law on those matters. Um, a related question is the question of um, is this a public purpose of a government and should the government be from a legal perspective in the business of operating a public bank. And I think again um, the debate would be likely to be in the 21st century um, that the government can do many things that its citizens um, and that its governing body authorizes it to do. There are some limitations placed uh, by um, common law and by state constitutional law on those questions. As the years have gone by, the role of government has generally been considered to be broader. That would be a question that would need to be examined. Um, there are issues related to the anti-donation clause and similar constitutional provisions related to um, rules relating to investment of funds. Um, those, again, are questions that are outlined in the legal opinions report. In my own mind, again, they present certain questions about the meaning of some of the words in our Constitution, how those words have been interpreted by the courts over time. Uh, generally speaking, my own view is, um, and I think supported by law, that the anti-donation clause restricts a government from being a guarantor or from acting as a party that would pay somebody else's debt and restricts a government from donating its money. It does not restrict the government, in my view, from making loans, so long as there is consideration in return. And it does not restrict the government from entering into contracts where there is consideration that runs in both directions can be enforced by a court as a contract as a matter of law. But again, long, varied history on the anti-donation laws on those questions. Um, there are also state statutory considerations regarding the manner in which governments can invest their funds and the manner in which those funds can be put to use when they're not being invested. Um, those are other questions that would have to be considered as a matter of law. Um, there is um, not a great deal of case law regarding um, some of the questions of investment, but there is some. There's statutory law regarding 
the nature of um, what the legislature expects governments to do with their money, but doesn't really touch on the question of whether an investment in this kind of entity would be appropriate. There are possibilities of looking at legislation. Again, that's all written up in the legislative report. Um, finally, and this is something that is, will be covered by the um, regulatory discussion, um, in order to be a chartered bank, you either have to be chartered under state law or under federal law. There's a series of um, considerations under both of those um, uh, regulatory bodies that would need to be taken into consideration in order to be a chartered bank. The city can't just declare itself a chartered bank. It needs to enter into discussions and ultimately applications with those bodies. And again, the report covers all those matters. So I would say that that would be our report of the subcommittee. I don't know whether my um, colleague on the committee wants to add anything else to the report. Okay, thank you. So then now, if anyone wants to ask questions about the legals, what I would do is ask you to stand up and line up in front of the microphone. Please limit your questions to about two minutes, and we'll try to answer them as best as you can. Uh, hi, Burl Breckner. I'll be speaking later. I had requested five minutes, so I'm not going to use time now. Uh, Burl Breckner, B E R L, B R E C H N E R, from, from Santa Fe. Um, I just had one question about your terminology on the virtue and, and Najar study or yes. report. You did refer to it as an opinion at one point in your uh, speaking just now. Is it an opinion letter or just a memorandum? That's a fair question. Thank you. I think that Virtue and Ja would say that it is a detailed memorandum. Um, for those of you not especially well versed in this, when a lawyer gives a technical legal opinion, the lawyer is saying, I believe that this is what the law is, and I believe that it would be unreasonable for a court to determine otherwise. That's the standard of a technical legal opinion. A memorandum, on the other hand, is a more studied writing on what are the issues that are presented, what are the pros and cons, how will these things, how could these things likely be decided? And I think to be fair to Virtue and Najar, um, I would call their work a memorandum and would not say that there were provisions in there where they ultimately said on any particular point that it would be unreasonable for a court to hold otherwise. Um, on the other hand, I would also say there was nothing in there that gave the opinion that it would be unreasonable for a court to allow this kind of activity to occur. I think it is more in, in the nature of a, a reasoned memorandum. I hope that was helpful. Okay. Other questions on the legal subcommittee? Hi, I'm Nicole Lykin. I live at 2929 Camino del Bosque. And <clears throat> I just wanted an update on the idea that the Attorney General might be um, asked to give an opinion on uh, the, a public bank and the anti-donation clause. And if so, um, would that be something the task force would refer or make a referral or do you think that's even necessary? So again, a fair question. Let me talk a little bit about the practice of um, obtaining Attorney General's opinion. Um, the public, and by the public I believe I would also mean members of an appointed task force, do not have the authority to go to the Attorney General and say, give me a formal opinion on this. Those who can request an opinion of the ter Attorney General are um, generally members of the legislature or elected officials at the state level. Um, if you pressed me this afternoon to say, can the city council request a legal opinion. I'm not sure that I can answer that off the top of my head, but I think it would be easy enough for the city council to ask one of the local legislators to pursue an opinion. Um, if that were the case, then the attorney generals um, would be charged with answering questions based on particular sets of facts. And the attorney general issues different kinds of opinions. Some of them are called advisory opinions. Some of them are more formal um, published opinions. Um, the weight of an attorney general's opinion is not as strong as a decision by a court. It doesn't make law, but it is impressive evidence to a court 
in regard to how the government's attorneys have viewed a certain question. Um, lawyers often rely on attorney general's opinions short of causing there to be litigation um, or going to a court for an answer by saying, I can create uh, my own judgment on this based on resources that include attorney general's opinions. Courts can say, in determining our answer to this, we have reviewed attorney general's opinions. But it is not um, without exception that an attorney general's opinion would be accepted by the court. And there are some cases that I could point you to where a court has said, we don't agree with that attorney general's opinion, we're going to hold it in another way. So you would consider all of those things in regard to the manner of going forward, and then depending on the facts and circumstances, and depending ultimately on what the governing body might want to, want to do, they may choose to seek attorney general's opinions on certain aspects of this, either by themselves if they can, and I'm not certain of that, or by asking members of the local legislative delegation to um, help them through those issues. And my sense is that there would be members of the local legislative delegation who would be happy to um, be able to pose those questions. I, I hope that was helpful. Any other questions on the legals? Yes, sir. Help us with your name, because even though this is not a formal James Trujillo. Thank you. Even though there's not a formal public hearing, we want the record to be as transparent as possible. So that's why we're asking everybody. I'm a realtor uh, from Colorado, recently moved to Santa Fe a year ago. And um, when I hear a city-owned bank, the first thing that comes to my mind being from Colorado is, will this bank accept uh, legal medical marijuana deposits? I'm not in the business, but I know that's a huge controversy in Colorado being from there. And, and hearing city-owned bank, that's why many people were looking into it in Colorado was there's a huge banking crisis in, in, in Colorado where businesses have no way to deposit their money. So that was a, a legal, I don't know if that's now is the right time to ask that question, but is that addressed? Uh, I think that's a good question. I can't say that we have addressed it in any particular detail. Um, I will tell you what I know about the issue. There's a lot of tension between federal law and state law. In New Mexico, we have medical marijuana facilities, but we don't have general use of marijuana as in Colorado. Colorado has that, some other states have that, but federal law still treats marijuana as a um, controlled substance. And so federal law, including federal banking law, is in conflict with um, local banking law and local use of marijuana. It's a very tangled question. Um, I understand that there are some considerations in other jurisdictions about where the banks might be able to engage in that business, but we have not answered that question here yet. Are they? Are you considering accepting that money? I, all I, I'm not in the business, but I know there's literally billions of dollars not being used by banks in Colorado. It's it's in the billions, literally. I, I appreciate the comment, and I um I will sort of refer the issue to my other members as we go forward. But to date, we not have not made a study of it. Thank you. But I do appreciate the comment. Other questions on legal. Yeah, Mr. Chair, task force members, I'm Craig O'Hare. My question isn't really on legal. It's really just a comment about the agenda and format for this meeting. I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'm kind of a big picture sort of person, and I feel like we've leaped into the weeds really quickly without getting a sense of the, well, the big picture and the overview, which is what is your well, charge I, under the... I, I appreciate that. Um, but I will say that in, in formulating the manner in which we did this, we wanted to inform the public first about what we were doing. We wanted to allow, at the end of the meeting, significant time for more general uh, uh, questions and discussion. But we felt that rather than just give our reports right now, we would give the reports and then have people to ask brief questions. So we're going to follow that mechanism. But please stay. I don't think it's going to take all that long. Uh, my, my point was basically that it seems like it would have been helpful to have an overview of what is your charge as a task force, what does Resolution 2017-32 charge you to do and by when just sort of give that kind of big picture orientation on what's your mission and by when are you going back to, you know that kind of orientation sure, about sure, sure. what fair is enough. your charge fair enough fair Thank enough you. um so let me um answer that um we are charged with um limited work and that work is to um study particular areas that would allow us to make a report to the governing body on the questions of um whether the governing body should proceed with the work of a public bank. We have six months to do that work. 
Um, we were charged with um, reporting to the Finance Committee of the City Council um, at the halfway mark about what our work is. We will be making that report in the first week of December. Um, I will tell you that there are some issues that have come up regarding what the Council specifically is looking for in regard to the resolution. Um, and one question being, are we to give them a recommendation or are we rather to report the pros and cons? There are different readings of the resolution. I'm hoping to raise that with the Finance Committee at their meeting in December so that I can get a clearer, um, a clearer response as to what their expectations are on that. Um, but the resolution itself called for three things, actually. It called for an opinion of the city attorney. The city attorney has been working, as I said, with outside counsel, working on those issues, but it didn't say um, more, much more than that. It called for a report from the finance department, uh, which report was delivered in June of this year and which is also part of the public record, and that report was on steps that the finance de department has taken in the last several years regarding its banking matters, and then it required the task force to meet and to address questions that we interpreted to be um, broken down into the four subcommittees that we recreated. And I appreciate your reminding me that we should have been a little more diligent in setting that out for you folks, and I hope that that answered the broad questions that you had. Okay, thank you. Any, anything further? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm a retired banker at KOE in IG. Would a public bank have to uh, secure uh, public deposits with collateral, have collateral set aside um, <coughs> to ensure those, those deposits? Randy, why don't you go ahead? If, if those deposits are with a global bank, the global bank has to set aside uh, collateral to secure those public deposits. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah well, I'm going to let I'm going to let Randy um, answer the question in detail. We are aware of the collateral requirements under state law, both the 102 percent and the 50 percent tests, um, and the question of whether a public bank would have to collateralize its own deposits in effect is an interesting question, but Randy, why don't you go ahead? Well, you very much answered it. At present, uh, deposits have to be collateralized at 102% of their face value. Uh, there is provision in the statute, Brad, you might have to help me here, that allows the collateralization to go to 50% uh, with named, I believe it's named institutions uh, being subject to that reduced requirement. But at present, you would have to seek a variance on that of some kind. Thank you. Okay. Anything further on the legals? If not, I'm going to let the regulatory go next. So, Randy, are you going to make that report? Yeah, Judy and okay. I next. Okay, good. Randy and Judy are our regulatory people. As they said, th they've worked very hard for us. Um, both are retired bankers who have moved recently to Santa Fe. I say recently. I moved 37 years ago, but they're here less than 10 years. Randy from the Midwest, where he ran community banks, and Judy from uh, New England, where she was the compliance chief for the Toronto Dominion banks in our country in the New England region. They've done very good work for us. All right, well, we met with the individuals and entities shown up on the screen there. <clears throat> and I think our most informative meeting was probably with the Financial Institution Division. Brad, could you click to the next one? In meeting with the Financial Institutions Division, we came in to, uh, became aware of a number of issues and obstacles that they see uh, as standing in the way of applying for a charter. Uh, first is, is the much talked about anti-donations clause. The, uh, the FID firmly believes that a public bank would be in violation of the anti-donation clause and at least at present would refuse to issue a charter based on that. Collateralization of city deposits, we just touched on briefly. Uh, in order to have funds to lend or the city to have funds to lend itself or to pay off its existing bonds, there would have to be a waiver of that requirement. Otherwise, the deposits uh, made would have to be collateralized. There'd be no liquidity. Um, FDIC insurance, any, any bank that receives a state charter in the state of New Mexico is required to have deposit insurance in some form. Uh, most typical would be the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation insurance. That body has come out and said they would look very, very closely at a public bank applying for FDIC insurance 
Their concern shared with the FID is the separation between the political process and the election cycle and the safety and soundness of the bank. Federal Reserve membership, same thing. They're, they would look very closely um, at any type of application for membership. A state chartered bank need not be a member of the Federal Reserve, but if it were, it would imply a greater level of scrutiny in terms of federal and state oversight in terms of its regulation. Uh, one thought we discussed was a limited purpose charter, whether we could, uh, if the initial phase of the bank would be, the city would be its sole customer, could we get a limited charter to pare down all the, uh, to pare down everything to, to allow that to be more efficient? Uh, they don't issue limited purpose charters in the state of New Mexico. The FID was also concerned that uh, a bank might be subject to the Open Meetings Act, whereby uh, all the bank's board meetings, all of its books and records, all of its loan files would be open to public, uh, to public scrutiny, and they would want uh, some clarification on that. Uh, again, the independence of management and the board of directors is a critical aspect uh, to the regulatory authority uh, in terms of its considering issuing a charter. Um, Another issue came up in terms of dedicated long-term capital. If, if the initial capitalization came from the general funds of the city, uh, would that capital be maintained in perpetuity? And if it needed to be augmented, uh, would, the, would current uh, administrations or the election cycle allow that to happen? Um, a more fundamental concern was really the available liquidity in the city of Santa Fe to both capitalize and, and initially fund a bank. Um, the five-year plan that was put out by the, Bra I believe it was the Brass Tax Group, um, called for immediately $100 million of deposits to fund the bank. In discussions with city staff, uh, I was having difficulty coming up with that amount of money. Uh, that was free and clear to be able to be deposited in the bank that wasn't already earmarked. Um, I put in here best practices of the City of Santa Fe Treasury Division. Um, there was suggestion made in the feasibility study that the city could itself prepay some of its bonds, defease its bonds, uh, with readily available cash, and they've done so. Uh, and I thought it appropriate to, to put that on the presentation. Next one, please. So in summary, I thought I'd list here some of the major items that would need to be addressed before we could even get to the application phase uh, with, the, with the financial institutions division. That again includes the anti-donation clause. Permissible investments. Uh, does the city have the legal right under current statute to capitalize the bank? And David, you might be able to speak more generally on that. Uh, the home rule powers, I think you touched on before, collateralization of public monies, again, that would have to be cleared up, and the Open Meetings Act. Um, there's significant cost and time to preparing, preparing the various applications for not only the Financial Institutions Division, but the FDIC. Uh, the FDIC application alone uh, suggests it requires about 250 hours. Uh, of work, and, and that's without considering the, uh, the Federal Reserve application. Um, operating costs of a public bank are significant, just the overhead alone. Uh, Judy, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, um, uh, very briefly. In addition to the, um, the challenges that David and Randy have both mentioned, once one had a bank, uh, then the other side of the coin is looked at, and that is operating the bank. Um, depending on what the functions of the bank are going to be, that will also depend on what regulations of the government kick in. If um, It will also entail staffing the bank. So the operating cost is kind of a, a very wide breaststroke term. Um, but think of it as the people who run the bank, the operations of the bank, the systems of the bank, the monitoring of the activities, et cetera. So it's just, it, it's not, um, there's no definitive number that we could say it would cost this much. We did do a quick 
look at um, smaller banks just to get a sense as to what the percentage of assets were for the amount of money that they put toward non-interest expense, um, meaning um, all the overhead costs. Uh, we had looked at um, a three or four uh, small banks, because again, we're thinking of this as a public bank, not as a large commercial bank. Um, and the majority of the percentages were anywhere from 2% to 2 and 3 quarter percent of, um, of a percentage of assets that went towards non-income non, uh, expense, non-interest expense. So that, does, that is not any um, absolute number to throw out and say that's what it's going to cost, but it is one of the hurdles that we, you, we have to look at as if indeed this, when this becomes something, then what are the associated costs to run it and maintain it? And even more importantly for the public to report back to the public as to what's going on. So there's that, that larger cost there that um, is something that we are all aware of, but we can't quantify it until there was further uh, review, as Randy said, with a more intensive study. And that was a regulatory concern. They had uh, based m much of their comment on the five-year plan and the feasibility study uh, that had uh, anticipated, I believe, four and a half full-time equivalent employees. Uh, and the, again, the regulators were quite concerned that that wasn't sufficient. Other operating expense was in that plan at a million dollars. Uh, Two percent on a hundred million dollars in assets suggests more like two million dollars. Right, and, and um, as Randy said, the regulators were, did, did express concern because at the end of the day, the regulators' expectation of any bank is that, one, you've got the processes, um, the effective processes that are working the way it should, and even more importantly, you've got an oversight function that can ensure that what should be happening in the bank is happening and that what is, needs to be corrected in any operational process is being corrected. And again, that would take ongoing staffing um, one, uh, until we've got a more fulsome um, uh, expectation of the functions of the bank. I don't think you could answer the question on exactly what that means uh, until you've got a better handle on ex through the research what the bank would do, what regulations would be involved, and therefore what kind of staffing would be needed to ensure that it's in compliance and effective through its process. Thank you, Judy. The, uh, the last uh, bullet point was a regulatory concern on industry opposition or just, just the industry in general. Uh, when they look to approve a charter, the regulators are looking for uh, the need that the bank is going to serve within the community. And uh, they had some concerns that Santa Fe was, was well banked at this point across the spectrum from credit union to bank and uh, raised that as a concern. I'd be happy to entertain questions. Questions again on the regulatory report. I'd ask that you limit your um, questions to a brief two-minute presentation. Angela Merker from Albuquerque. Is it clear that um, the FDIC regulations would be required since this bank is not going to be making um, doing work with individuals rather with organizations? At present, um, the state requires any state chartered institution must have insur uh, deposit insurance in some form. And again, most typically that would be the FDIC. In the case of uh, the Bank of North Dakota that's often quoted, um, they have their deposits banked by the full faith and credit of exactly. the state. Thank you. If I'll just uh, briefly comment on that as well. The charge that we got from um, city council was to study the formation of a chartered bank. So we're working under that, uh, um, that charge. Um, I might also say that as a legal matter, um, offering the full faith and credit of the city of Santa Fe um, for the banking institution could be problematic as a matter of law. Other questions on the regulatory report? Seeing none. Um, I think let's move on to the capitalization report, Bob Meng. Uh, Bob is a, uh, another um, 
citizen who has retired to Santa Fe is active still in a variety of venture capital and um, capital raising um, uh, ventures. Um, he has experience outside of the banking community in regard to raising dollars and has brought uh, an important um, point of view to us in um, thinking about capitalization questions. Thank you. Um, first, let me say that we don't have uh, something to show you on the screen. Uh, Wayne Miller, who is the, the other person on the subcommittee who couldn't be here tonight, has been ill with a severe, very severe pain because of a back ailment. And so we weren't able to get together to agree on our report until just this morning, and that was too late to get it into the um, uh, to on the, onto the screen. But there are copies that are now being handed out if you wish to look at, and I will use those. That is my the basis for my remarks. <coughs> um, because the city would be the uh, pro the uh, one to capitalize such a bank. Uh, we assumed that it would have to, the funds for that would have to become have to come from Santa Fe, the city of Santa Fe, or be collateralized by the city of Santa Fe. And so we have limited our contact and search of, for capital uh, to discussions with the city finance department. Uh, from that, we came up with three different possible ways that the bank could be collateralized using city uh, resources, but there are uh, caveats and restraints to those three. The first was that using general obligation bonds and or the city's liquid assets would, the finance department believes, jeopardize the city's bond rating at the current time. Second, using revenue bonds is also a possibility uh, based on the bank's viability. If the bank could convince a, uh, uh, people buying the bonds that it would be viable and would be able to uh, take on a long-term bond uh, and make the payments from its profits, uh, that would be one way of doing it. The other way would be to go to a city vote and uh, have the citizens of Santa Fe uh, stand behind it through the, a, a possible increase in property taxes if the bank was not able to perform on the bond. And a third way is that there is, you probably all are aware of the 160 million that was recently invested through Wells Fargo Bank. And that those funds could become available uh, to a public bank if everybody agreed because it, it's on a 60-day notice, as I understand it, to, to withdraw those funds. But of those, of that 160 million, much of it is restricted and very, uh, very strongly restricted and could not be used to capitalize the bank, uh, the public bank. But there is according to the information they gave me, uh, about 50 million that could conceivably be invested is for capitalization of a public bank. If the board or the trustees who are overseeing those individual funds that make up the total of about 50 million uh, were agreed that the bank was worth investing in. So without being able to have an offering or a uh, prospectus or, or even a, a business plan to present, at this point we can't determine whether that's even viable or not, whether they would be interested. It would be an independent judgment on the part of each board of each fund that could conceivably be used this way. So our conclusion at this point is that if the public bank had a business plan or an offering or a um, prospectus that would demonstrate compelling value to Santa Fe, then it'd be worthwhile to pursue this. Uh, but, until, but not until uh, we have that could we go any further, I think. 
I'm open to any questions, and um, I'm not a banker. <laughs> questions on um, capitalization report? I want to thank you for going through this exercise because it really challenges you to think about all the issues, all the impediments, what are the risks, what are the rewards, because at this point your focus has been on the city, the city being the provider of equity or some sort of capital that the FDIC would accept as permanent capital. Um, I've known the chair uh, for a very long time. If anybody can figure out how to legally structure this, David Buckholz can do it. Uh, in 2001, with David's help, David, as a matter of fact, wrote the legislation that created the New, New Mexico SBIC which at that time got a quarter percent of the severance tax permanent fund, which was $10 million, with the purpose of in investing in equity at the time, not even loans, but investing equity in small businesses across the state. Um, unanimously passed um, by the House and the Senate, and they didn't have a clue how to structure this thing, how to manage this thing, I think this is fool's gold, and I know there's a lot of well-intentioned people here. I listened to Craig Barnes eight years ago in Owen Lopez's living room, sitting right beside me was Bill Enlow, who is the finest banker in New Mexico. And after 30 minutes, I said to Craig, this is the stupidest idea I have heard. Eight years later, it is still the stupidest idea I have ever heard. But again, I want to thank you for going through this effort. I think there's enough roadblocks and impediments. Unless people are willing to step up with at least $5 million or $10 million of equity commitment, that would be enough to support a $100 million portfolio. That would be enough to generate $2 million of operating profits, which would offset the costs of this endeavor. The city of Santa Fe can borrow 30-year tax-exempt money today at two and three-quarters percent. I'm an investment banker. I've done this all my business life. I, I, again, I applaud the people because they're well-intentioned, but if there's no business plan and if there's no P&L, this is a moot point, and thank you, guys. Right, thank you. Um, my apologies to the audience because, um, as Paul indicated, he is an old friend and a good client of mine, and we worked through some exciting things, and everything he said um, about what his experience has been, I can, I can verify. Uh, we'll have him come back if he likes a little bit more at the end because there wasn't exactly a pointed question there, but thank you. Thank you for speaking. Go ahead, sir. Yes, I'm Jim Lotus. A uh, question about the uh, capitalization. When you talk about these unrestricted funds investing in the, uh, in the public bank, uh, are you not talking about a grant of money? Uh, this, is, this is not really an investment. It's giving money to the bank, is it not? Well, that's not the way that we were looking at it. Um, a capital, capital in a bank is an investment, as, as I understand it, and uh, there is a, generally a return for those who have put up the capital. But they would, be, would they be able to uh, choose to liquidate that investment or withdraw the funds from the bank at, if they wish? Well, that would as be, would be the case that would most be part things. of the negotiation over the investment, but uh, I think it probably would be highly illiquid until the money were paid back. In, in other words, one possible way of doing it, of structuring it, would be that over if the bank is profitable year after year, instead of retained earnings it increasing the capitalization, you would be using some of those to return the capital plus some return 
to the investor. That's one way to structure it. Another way would be that uh, it's illiquid uh, going forward, but there would be uh, return uh, from profits each year. Another way would be, I suppose you could take it as you suggested, that it could be a grant, but that wouldn't be very attractive to get to raise the capital from what I understand. Thank you. Other questions on the capitalization? Seeing none, I'm going to now turn to um, Elaine and Dalla. Um, Elaine and Dalla worked very hard on a very important question of um, governance. Obviously, when you have public um, government involved with public monies, um, you need to be very, very careful about um, the manner in which that money is protected and the manner in which you um, have authority in regard to investments and spending. Um, I'll let Elaine take over from here, but they worked very, very hard on talking to a good number of experts in our community on issues about um, uh, government accountability, transparency, uh, avoidance of corruption in government, etc. So, Elaine, if you would. Thank you, David. I have been involved in this subject for several years. I was, in fact, in the room with you, Paul, with Bill, with Owen, <coughs> and with Craig Barnes. I remember your excitement at that time about this <laughs> subject. <coughs> One of the things that has been clear from the beginning is the importance of a governance model that would assure the public that the city would not be asked to do yet another thing. The city would not be asked to run a bank, run a public bank, but rather that there would be created a governance model that would put in right relationship the various entities involved in effectively running a bank. And so what Darla and I have been interested in doing is figuring out a draft of ideas from a number of people, and we are still interviewing more and would love to have your suggestions. What we are trying to do is establish what would be right relationship among four entities. One would be a bank board involved in oversight and policy. Another would be a citizen advisory board, particularly looking at um, issues of transparency, trying to help the appropriate transparency to happen for the public. Uh, another would be clearly the bank management itself, and the other would be the relationship to the city, to the city council and to city staff. Pursuing this, there's, no, there's not one out there. There's no model out there that is a public bank that is looking at how to gather together those four different entities. And so there was no place to go except to begin creating a governance model, a draft, from a number of people's experiences about how governance could happen most effectively when there are several entities involved. So what you see on the screen first is uh, people that we have contacted so far, or categor categories of people we have contacted so far. And in each instance, we are saying, given your experience, what would be, what could you offer to this growing draft about how, in particular, the parts of the bank, the bank board, the citizen advisory board, and the bank management could be most effectively in relationship to the city so that there would be not undue political influence, so that the public would be assured that there was, in fact, an independent bank operating. So this is a category of people that we have so far been talking with. And if we could have the next slide, please. The first point I've really already spoken to, it's just absolutely critical to have this appropriate relationship so that there is accountability and there is transparency. And the second one, uh, though, though these separate governance bodies must be deeply accountable and communicative, they also must be independent of one another. Um, as we look at the Bank Oversight Policy Board and the Citizen Advisory Board, it's pretty clear that there could be a, a way developed 
so that people would be, first of all, our, the first step we thought about was um, counselors very involved in this as counselors would turn to their, their districts in the city and given the specific expertise required for the bank board members, counselors would begin encouraging their district members who are qualified to apply to be a part of this bank board and the, and the citizen advisory board. And there would then be vetting done by the appropriate groups, for example, for to have a person on the bank board with the appropriate legal expertise so they could do effective policy and oversight. We would be working perhaps with the American Bar Association, with the New Mexico Bar Association, so that uh, the appropriate vetting organizations in the case of city, uh, of uh, community members as parts of these boards, community organizations and neighborhood associations would be appropriate vetting organizations so that when it ended up probably with the city council and with public involvement, we would have had this vetting process uh, have occurred by people who know those folks who were saying, I'd like to be a part of this. And I think I'm ready to pass it to you. Next, we looked at the challenges and opportunities of a governance structure. And the challenges we identified were how to ensure transparency. How are we going to structure the governance so that transparency is available to the public? We looked at the current lack of understanding and trust in what a public bank could accomplish apart from what it can be a pump be accomplished by existing entities. So we do recognize that existing entities uh, have their place, but what place could separate a public bank and um, what could it accomplish that others can't? Um, we looked at the organization of an effective vetting process and qualified available volunteers who, re who uh, reflect our entire community. We really felt it was important for the entire community to be reflected in some area of governance on a public bank. Except we looked at the acceptance of a public bank by city staff. Would they be able to work well together? Would they accept it and trust that process? Um, we looked at stepping outside the norm to do something that hasn't been done before. There's um, some building of confidence and building of trust to trust something that hasn't been done before. We looked at maintaining commitment by community leaders to have the public bank move forward, um, especially when there's changes in elected officials. We identified the opportunities and some of the opportunities that a public bank affords is having a transparent institution handling our public funds. Another opportunity is greater involvement by the public in determining how our public funds will be put to work in our community. And an opportunity is long-term partnering, partnering with other local institutions with more capital circulating and meeting community needs. By leveraging that partnering, we're hoping that more capital, more money could be circulated for projects in the city. An opportunity is a reduction in fees and costs that are paid to financiers who do not live within our community, which keep more tax dollars in our local area. The multiplying effect is what that oftentimes uh, you hear people talk about. And another opportunity is our neighbors, friends, colleagues, and community members would be involved in oversight and operation of the bank, which makes it easier to find out what is happening and holds people more accountable. Okay, um, we'll take questions now on the governance model. Questions on governance.
Uh, Burl Breckner again. Uh, thank you. Um, related to the advisory board and the board of directors that would have to be selected, um, do you envision that they would be paid, uh, b both of those groups, individuals on both of those groups would be paid? Would they receive, in, would they be ins insured under normal board insurance policies, you know, for liability, uh, directors and officials liability, that sort of thing? And then I have one follow-up question. I think these are very important questions and we have not addressed them yet. And related to that is, is by my calculation, this city government and its various agencies have at least 60 task forces, advisory boards, committees that include members of the public. And this is a comparatively small city. Um, there's. I'm sure a lot of people who will volunteer for this sort of thing, uh, or who wish to volunteer, but a lot of people are already tapped out who are available to be volunteers. So I, I just hope you'll keep that in mind as well. Finding talent in this town uh, to serve on these boards is going to be a challenge. Um, I, I'm speaking only for myself and not for the members of the board. Um, my sense on some of your questions were this. Um, I don't envision the need for a payment or insurance to those persons who would be the experts who would vet the people who were volunteering to be board members. Similar, in, a, in a similar circumstance under our Constitution, and this was um, an idea that was floated with us by um, Senator Worth, um, under our Constitution, the way we pick judges is that a volunteer committee is appointed by the governor, um, the majority and minority uh, members of the um, House of uh, the, the legislature, and other specified groups. Those experts serve without pay and then vet applications for people who want to be judges, bring it down to a shorter list, and then the elected officials choose who the judges would be. I, I think we talked some about that kind of a body that would vet experts. On the other hand, I think the people who are actually charged with being the directors of the bank have a longer term, more responsible and potentially more risky proposition. And so I would think the question of both what insurance would be available for those people and whether those people would be paid in some matter are good questions that deserve to be studied with some care. So uh, summarizing, I envision sort of public people who want to do well or do good uh, would constitute the group that would vet members of the public who would be interested in participating in managing the bank in some significant way. But those people who were chosen ought to expect that they would have similar kind of protections as though they were serving on a bank that was not um, owned by the city, if you will. Thank you. Yeah. you more questions you on governance or more comments? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that I believe under regulations that the board of directors does have to have DNO insurance for a, for a bank, a chartered bank. Yes, sir. Jim Lotus again. I'd like to ask about something that hasn't been addressed and seems not to fall under any of the four. Uh, in the original feasibility study, they were using figures like uh, $220 million being deposited by the, the uh, city, uh, that the city would then turn around and borrow $50 million on which they'd pay uh, a rate of interest of 3%. Uh, they'd get 1% on their $220 million in deposits, and that 2% net interest margin would generate a million dollars, which would cover the estimated operating costs of the bank. That was how it was explained in the feasibility study that the numbers all worked. Uh, are you studying whether or not the city is going to deposit 220 million? A figure of 110 came out today. How are you studying whether the 
city is actually going to borrow $50 million since that plus whatever the bank earns on its investments uh, is its source of income. Uh, a figure was mentioned tonight that it may cost two and three quarters percent of total assets to operate the bank. That would be two, two and three quarters million dollars. Uh, that's almost three times the estimated operating cost uh, contained in the feasibility study. So is, is anybody looking at whether the numbers even remotely work out before you go to a lot of hoop jumping and hurdle jumping? Brandon, do you want to speak? Sure. Yes, I have been looking at that. <coughs> and the broad brush approach used by the five-year model, <coughs> um, in my personal opinion, is not accurate in all regards. Um, when you say the city was going to borrow <coughs> the $50 million, <coughs> pardon me, the, um, really the idea would be for the city to deposit their money. Hopefully it doesn't have to be collateralized. It, it's not earmarked. It's available for a deposit, which it isn't and then the city would borrow that money to in essence pay off its existing bonds so you can you can create the spread at whatever you want to make the bank profitable or not but it has to it has to mirror market conditions of course so there are there are questions about the model its accuracy and and that type of thing am i answering your question somewhat uh the city has, I believe, prepaid certain loans and bonds. They've that done the that. Yeah. They've done that on their own, but I don't know how much that is. Uh, but one of the mysteries in the original study was what the city would use the fifty million dollars for that it would borrow back from the bank. Uh, it's almost as if the f operating figure of a million dollars a year. Uh, was the first piece of information. Then they said, well, we need a net interest margin of 2%, therefore right. the city has to borrow $50 million back. But it was never really clear where that $50 million was going to go or, or whether the city even would. Why? I mean, is it feasible? If Suppose the city only borrows $3 million back. And instead of getting a million dollars in net interest margin or whatever it is, it, don't, it gets uh, whatever, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Even, are even, you, I mean, do we... Even, are more, you, fun, even more fundamentally, w um, are those funds available? Are, they, are there unrestricted funds available to use to prepay the bond debt, and that, that answers your question. That's where the $50 million that's, that's, is going. That's maybe the first question. That's the first question. And in terms of operating expenses, I think you have to realize that staffing levels for a bank that was solely uh, dedicated to the city would not be the same as even smaller community banks around. But even factoring that in, a 1% assumption versus a 2 and 3 quarters percent assumption, it's somewhere in the middle. So call it 2%, you're $2 million bucks on $100 million. Right? True. I mean, I, I'm willing to accept that, but I, my question is, are you looking at the f financial feasibility of the whole thing viewed as it on the scale of what Santa Fe can do versus the operating expenses as it may be required by the FDIC, which doesn't care that Santa Fe only has 75,000 people? Uh, and and so on and so forth. I, you're you're doing a lot of work, and I'm sure it's it's good work. But if you get to the end of the road, and the dog don't hunt, then you've wasted a whole lot of time. The city has to have the liquidity, the unrestricted liquidity, to make this work. I don't believe it does. 
I, I think the questions are well taken. In regard to the work that we're doing, we come from different backgrounds. We have different levels of expertise. We're trying to teach each other about those different pieces. Um, I think we are working at a very basic building block level on questions such as what money does the city have? How is that money dedicated to other resources? What's the result of that dedication? How has the city dealt with its financing um, over the last number of years? And I'll digress for a minute just so that everybody understands. When we say that the city has repaid some of its debt, I think what we're saying is that the city has, in large part, borrowed at lower rates in order to repay a higher uh, interest debt. It's like refinancing a house. In the bond parlance, it's called a refunding of the bonds. But it's a, it's a borrowing at a lower interest rate to make higher interest rate go away. Brad will help me on this. There may have been some additional funds available to cause some of that payment to be paid down. There was the $17 million, I believe, from the water fund that was actually right. hard cash. So some hard right. cash was there just to sort of prepay its debt. And then um, I wanted to make one other point on that that slipped my mind. Um, but in any, in any event, um, oh, I know what it was, that part of that repayment, if you will, also adjusted the collateral that would be in place to make repayment of that debt so that that collateral could be used for other purposes. In, a, in another way of speaking, on the water system, as I understand it, there was also a pledge of a certain cash flow of gross receipts taxes, and that the reborrowing at the lower rate also allowed the freeing up of that gross receipts taxes for other purposes. So that's well, what we've done. So we've studying all of that, and then determining how much money might really be available for capitalization, and then getting into the question of if you find that some amount of money for capitalization, and you find the legal ability to capitalize the bank, if you will, in what I envision to be some relatively complex investment vehicle that would have some nature of equity, some nature of debt, but would not be a gift or a donation. It would be some instrument that would have a return on capital. How much money would that generate in your ability to borrow? And then who would you lend it to and for what purpose? So we're deep into all of that. Do we have all of our answers yet? Probably not. Have we done really good work for three months? I think we have. Um, but part of the forum today was, as you are here, and I appreciate it, to test us on what we've done so far, to make sure we're moving in the right direction, and to listen to what the public has to say, and then go back and review our notes and see where we are on that. So I think that's some of my answer to the questions you raise, and then some thanks to say some of the questions that you've raised we may not have considered in the detail that they deserve, and we still have some time to do that. Brad. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to direct um, the audience to read the June 5th um, letter to the council from Finance Director Adam Johnson. It details what the city staff has done addressing a lot of the issues of management in the uh, feasibility study. When the feasibility study was written, the um, outstanding debt for the city was roughly $372 million, and we were earning maybe 30 basis points on our funds. We've, subsequent to that time, we've um, refinanced, as the chairman has said. We've also paid off a large chunk of the water debt, and we also defeased the 2008 uh, general obligation bond, which means we paid it off. Um, and so that was a big portion of the reduction from $372 million to $248 million of outstanding debt. The portfolio today is currently earning in excess of one and a quarter percent. And so when you look at the feasibility study from three years ago, uh, the, not only have the investments world changed substantially, but what the city has done with that, and it's pretty well laid out in uh, finance director's memo to the uh, city council. So I'd encourage you to look at that as some answers. Actually, I have read it, and uh, that's part of the reason for my question because the landscape has changed dramatically from the original feasibility study. And I, uh, I guess I encourage 
let's let me make it a that as opposed to a question. I encourage you to do a new pro forma on the whole proposition. Are, is the public bank going to be able to generate sufficient revenues to support itself to pay something in excess of one and a quarter percent on the deposits and uh, meet all of its other obligations, whatever those may be. And I, I think it would behoove you to, uh, to do that uh, before spending money on legal opinions and so forth and so on. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Lee. Uh, I just want to point out that the resolution that the city council um, passed to create this task force had one other aspect to it, which was to, uh, after looking at the, the information that we've gathered, then to put together a pro forma or in the um, resolution wording was a business plan that would, I think, address your question. So the questions you're asking are right on as far as I'm concerned in terms of moving to the next step. Appreciate it. Any other questions on um, governance? I'm not sure uh, whether, uh, my name is Michael Collins, uh, Santa Fe County. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, gov whether this is governing or not. I'm a proponent, as far as I can tell, from what I understand, I'm another non-banker. Uh, I was concerned also about viability. Uh, I wondered about who are the uh, who are the lenders? Who are the uh, eligible lenders? Are they strictly within the city limits of Santa Fe only? I take it the people that that will be assisted. The borrowers. The borrowers. Okay. Well, I, I, uh, yeah, that's yes, what I meant. The remi borrowers. It, re it reminds me of um, uh, some comments that I should have made. We have been exploring, and I would hope to hear um, from the public more generally, and we will go to them soon. The question of what people think this bank is supposed to do. And so it's really been devised into, very simply, two different types of functions. One function, which you might call maybe the limited charter function, is where the borrowers, if you will, are limited to the city of Santa Fe itself or perhaps other public institutions. And there the question becomes, do those institutions need a chartered bank to take care of their financial affairs. The other kind of bank that we've talked about some is what we may have called the altruistic bank. And what I mean by that, I, I suppose, to talk r rather plainly, is that there is a sense in some sectors of our community that the community is not served by the national banking system, um, that they yearn for a day where banking may not have been so expensive or complex or not non-transparent and that the existence of a bank owned by the government that would have banking services available to a broader community might be more attractive from a social, political, and cultural sense, as well as a, a, a thing that the government's supposed to do in order to bring us back to a day where the, bank, where the banking system was not um, so challenging to our general public. Now, I'm not saying whether I agree with that or not, but that's the other sense that we've gotten call that the altruistic bank. I don't think we've made any decisions. We certainly haven't made any decisions about whether if we had an altruistic bank, who would be limited to using its services. I, I don't think we've thought about that yet. But we do sort of understand that there's this variety of ideas about who would the bank serve, running from the one hand to maybe one customer. We just have a bank for ourselves. And then you get into this relatively complex financial analysis of what does that mean and how does that work. And if you're scratching your head about that, we all scratch our heads about that some. It's relatively hard to get through. And then everybody sort of understands, we're going to be very flipped for a minute, what sometimes in the back room we call the Jimmy Stewart Bank, by which I mean a bank from the days of It's a Wonderful Life, where you walked in and everybody knew your name and they gave you a mortgage and everything was fine. Call that more seriously the altruistic bank and whether that's something that uh, the governing body ought to consider. So we are thinking about those things, but we haven't come to any answers. Yet. Right. I was wondering about competition, for instance, uh, a community foundation, that kind of thing. Um, uh, banks that are better heal, well healed than, than we would be to compete with us, 
uh, at a lower interest rate, like well, like right now the city funds are with Wells Fargo, right? Well, Wells Fargo is the fiscal agent. That's what I mean, the fiscal agent. It doesn't you know. necessarily mean we're, all, we're invested only with Wells Fargo, but they act as our, the, the, we use their mechanics to do our banking. They, they would continue, the money wouldn't, yeah, that'd be. Not, not clear at this point. Yeah, but I wondered about that competition in general, uh, and, and as well as, well, it, obviously it's not going to be with local banks, because you'd be assisting, if anything, local banks, right? S sort of like North Dakota does. It seems like it's sort of a distant cousin of North Dakota, <laughs> uh, since it's a state uh, public bank, and so it var varies quite a bit from... I appreciate that. Here's, here's what I'd like to do now, though, if you don't mind. Um, and if there are no other questions on governance. Um, I don't know how many of you want to speak um, to the board and address your thoughts or concerns. I'd like to hear from anyone who wants to. And what I might suggest, if we could take a few minutes to catch our breath, and if you might give your names to Miss Martin, that she would then call names in the order that she received them, rather than have you stand up on a line for an hour or such. And then we'll give everybody several minutes to engage us in this kind of discussion. I, I don't want to be here all night, and I'm not, I'm, I may have to cut off some of that discussion after a little while, but I don't want to say there's going to be two minutes in a bell, because I don't want to do it with two minutes in a bell. We want to hear a little bit more than that. But if we could now have everyone who is interested in engaging the task force in, in listening to your own thoughts, and maybe have us respond some, if you would give your name to Miss Martin, um, and then we will get back to everybody and then call those names in that order. In the meantime, while we're doing that, um, I might read to you um, the question that was put together um, by Elaine and Bob that you might be thinking about if you're not sure about whether you want to speak to us because you don't know quite what you want to say, but you want to say something. So the question goes something like this. Santa Fe has a compelling need to efficiently provide government services and to create economic opportunity and prosperity for our residents. Do you believe that the formation of a public bank would address these needs and provide needed services? Would a public bank provide our existing banking community, community banks and credit unions, and governments the tools to render more effective services? Would a public bank provide added value to the economic health of Santa Fe? What risks or hazards do you believe a public bank might create? With your input, the task force can move towards clarifying what is the purpose of a public bank should be. So that's what we thought people might have on their mind that might want to address. I'd ask you to think about those things as you choose to sign up and um, give your name. And let's have a five-minute recess, and then we'll come back straight up at 7 o'clock. How's that? Thank you all. All right. That was good so far. So far, so good. Open that you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think we'll hear from you.
Okay, if everybody would get settled, as soon as my stenographer gets back, we're going to have public comment. I understand that 13 people have signed up to speak. Uh, without giving you any specific limitations, what I might ask is think about five minutes or so as you're outside. I'm not asking you all to speak for five minutes or don't come up, um, but think about that as sort of an outside margin and then maybe we can be done at about eight o'clock, which is what we had planned for. So as soon as, here's Elizabeth. So Elizabeth is back and if you, Elizabeth, if you would call the roll and um, have each person come up and speak, that would be great. Hi, thanks for all your hard work. Um, I mentioned earlier I was a realtor and, and my research in community banks and what I was wondering is, and, and I am not in the marijuana industry, but, and I'm, I'm not for or against, but I know there's, what happens in Colorado is that money is stashed under mattresses, for lack of a better term, and it's not being used. And in Oakland right now in LA, they're researching, they're doing the same thing we are here. And the impetus is to couple in Oakland the medical marijuana industry money to low income housing. That's, that's their main thrust. And being a realtor, having moved from Colorado, the home I sold, I'll, to buy the, a home here, twice the price, half the size. And even, a, I mean, a working person like myself with my wife working, we're having a hard time, you know, to find affordable housing. I mean, I'll never get what I had in Colorado, you know, 3,400 square feet on two acres. I just closed on it, sold for 290. It's, it'd be a million here, you know, or 750,000. But, I mean, that's my problem. But I just was wondering if the community bank will serve low-income people. That's what I'm hoping for is that it does help the low, lower income people find, you know, housing. It's, that's, that's a severe problem, as you all know, in this town. And I, I just would like to see it help that, the low income people. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Trio? Thanks very much. Thank you. My name is Alston Lundgren, and I've been a full-time resident of Santa Fe for almost 20 years. Well, first, I'd like to thank you all, uh, thank the task force for the good work investigating a non-conventional idea uh, for which there is limited precedent, and that, of course, is a public bank. One of my degrees is a Master of Business Administration in Finance. My main finance professor was particularly fond of saying that the eighth wonder of the modern world is fractional reserve banking. That's because fractional reserve banking is the mechanism that allows chartered banks, but only chartered banks, to make loans several times larger than their paid in capital. I'm glad that the city council resolution forming this task force specifically directed it to look at the feasibility of Santa Fe forming a chartered public bank. A chartered public bank does seem a way that the city can leverage its funds to make a big improvement in its financial condition. The bank could lend back to the city several times the bank's paid in capital uh, by lending a substantial portion of the city funds that are on deposit. Obviously, close attention to cash flow would be critical. However, the cost of city uh, cost of funds to loan would be very low allowing uh, uh, below market interest rates on loans. Alternatively, retained earnings could grow and then the bank would have the capability of making more substantial loans in the future. I'm puzzled why the fractional reserve banking is not getting major attention in the uh, open public meetings. I've been to all of them. Thank you. Um, if I could just ask a question or two. Um, I, don't, I want to repeat your words as carefully as I can. I believe I heard you say that a chartered bank would have the ability to borrow well beyond its capitalization. I mean, I'm sorry, to lend well beyond its capitalization. It, it, that's paraphrasing. Where would the charter bank get the money to lend beyond its capitalization? 
and how would it repay those funds? The funds that the bank could lend include the deposits, not just the paid in capital, but the deposits. That's what all big banks do. Their loans are much greater than their capital. In this case, if the city of Santa Fe puts in a number, $50 million, $100 million uh, into the bank, the bank could lend that money back to the city. Now, if those monies would have to, if those deposits would have to be capitalized, then you would have some detriment to the ability to make those loans because the protection of the deposited, deposited funds would come into play relative to your lending ability, if I understand the arithmetic right. Not aware of it. Okay, uh, Randy, did you want to? Well, I think <clears throat> again to the other gentleman's question, um, the f to have funds available to lend, those funds have to be available from the city, and we're still not certain that that's that's the case. Are there unencumbered funds that can be deposited in the bank and lent out to again prepay debt in in our example here? That, that is something that you're um, if I could just interrupt technical matter for a minute. If we could all speak into the microphone, then everybody in the audience could hear us. That is something that is under uh, investigation now, is it that? Right. Okay, good. Basic liquidity. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? No. All right, next then. Sure. one when I'm done. Hi, so I'm Ni Nicole Lycan, and while you can use your uh, deposits to um, cover your loans, you can also borrow on the overnight market uh, from the Fed, from the Federal Home Loan Bank, or from uh, the repo market. And that is where liquidity comes from with a charter bank that isn't available to people that manage a uh, a revolving loan fund like the city might have. And we used to have that 220000 and the city made really good use of it to get rid of our debt and to, t and to get it uh, paid off, but now we don't have that money anymore. And if we'd had a bank, we might have been able to leverage our capital to make payments and use the overnight market to um, hang on to some of that money because money, as we know, is handy. Um, so I understand that from the last meeting, which I couldn't attend because I was in Seattle speaking to the um, state, the Washington Infrastructure and Depository Bank Task Force. Um, they're looking at setting up a state bank for those purposes, and they're moving forward very quickly with it. Um, but I heard that the conversation was about financial literacy and uh, I and and banking and how important it is to educate people about the benefits of banking. But I want to remind you that many people in our community have been educated and shamed away from using banks, and it's intergenerational and it's many many years where they have felt that banks or credit unions were not their territory. So. We need to um, find a way to make banks more friendly and usable and approachable uh, for people in our community. And I know some credit unions are really working on that. Um, and we are financial literacy, the brass tax team, and the people that are here trying to help us think through this. And you were trying to understand what would the advantage be uh, and, you know, a pretty brave group of people we are to look at things honestly and straight, straightfully. But um, anyhow, I, I handed out packets because the brass tax team has done it again. We have a six-year model now, 
and we've taken a lot of your suggestions uh, and questions that you didn't have and uh, we looked at primarily financing the city's existing bond debt that will be callable between the years 2018 and 2023 and I know that the finance department will also be looking at it in their own way to find out how to uh, get rid of that debt uh, or have it be more affordable but um, a bank refinancing the city's existing debt is a really good way we think to get a bank up and running and um, it we also propose that it could be used for shovel-ready projects, not the big infrastructure projects we'll still need to bond, but for simpler projects. And then a portion of it is recommended in there um, that could be um, used for partnership lending through CDFIs like HomeWise or the business incubator or local community banks that want to lend for affordable housing and um, my partner in the brass tax is in here tonight i think she might not be well but she had some really whiz bang ideas for projects the city is already working on that a uh, bank could really help fund very well um, and uh, really make a big difference long term in our community in terms of affordable workforce housing um, and one of the reasons it's good to look at what the city's got and the debt they've got is that most banks have to look at running in the red for two or three years because it just takes a while to build up a profitable portfolio. And I hate to say it, but we're fortunate to have debt that we can refinance and get a bank up and going and be profitable within the first year. How much? I don't know. But the numbers before you, they're on the last page of section one. Um, you can look at, uh, we've refinanced just eight bonds and then a bunch of uh, smaller partnership lending increasing over a six year period. And in the first year, our ending balance was a million three. Um, our, and by the end of year six, our ending uh, balance was nine and a half million. Um, just for the ninth year, and that's just with refinancing debt and just a little bit of um, partnership lending in the community for things that we are legally permitted to do as a municipality already. Um, so number one, a public bank can help reduce the city's existing debt while making a profit. Uh, the interest the city and other boroughs pay to the public bank stays in the community to be reinvested in the community. It doesn't go we don't know where. Um, it can increase access to affordable credit through that, um, the leveraging of capital that is not available with a revolving loan fund. Um, it has access to the overnight borrowing through the Fed, through the Federal Home Loan Bank, and through the repo market that uh, um, the city does not have access to, is my understanding. Um, it, and they do it, you know, they can make a profit by lending. Our model shows two or three percent to uh, refinance the city's debt and um, fooling around with term, how long it's financed for. Um, and it saves the city money as well. It saved, over that six-year period, it saved the city $10,358,351 in overall debt, and uh, it saved 951000 in annual debt costs. So the thing is, infrastructure may sound boring, but it creates jobs, it boosts the economy, um, it puts money in the pockets of bankers and storekeepers and people that have those jobs and it creates more jobs. Um, it's really relatively easy to establish if infrastructure project actually benefits the community and it does so equitably. Um, more complex measurements are needed and should be done uh, to show the benefits of affordable housing and economic development. It's not enough just to lend. You want to know what the impact is of that lending and how does it create more potential in the community. Um, a public bank can require the city to do its due diligence in a way that they might not be required to do now. 
um, when it when it comes to borrowing. And, and I know there are plenty of hoops that you have to jump through, but it can require further hoops. Um, a public bank might help local financial institutions uh, to manage some of the burdensome regulatory requirements that they're now encountering, especially the smaller community banks, that we could be a think tank. And uh, it could help the unbanked. And I just want to talk about the altruistic public bank model, and that's the Sparkkasse model in Germany. It's an altruistic bank that is 200 years old. It was set up because people did not have access to banks. They were turned away or they were shamed away from their banks. And it was set up specifically for that. And they're in every town or village in Germany. And uh, the municipalities or villages put their money in those banks. And so do the individuals in those communities. And the profits from those banks go to benefit the community as a whole. Um, so um, I think it's a great idea to consider partnering, you know, with local government entities. There's some technical issues with that, but it is something we could look at that would make more liquidity um, for our bank. And um, there's less cash on hand since the first study because our money was paid down to pay off debt that we had or it was tied up. And, uh, we, you know, the brass tax team went, oh, no, there goes our money for the bank. But, you know, there's still money. If there's a will, there's a way um, to get it set up. So. Questions for Nicole? No, go ahead. I can, I'm ready. Um, you've mentioned that, uh, one, that the public bank would in bar lend money for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And infrastructure projects are typically paid back over longer periods of time, 10 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, there was a product um, that was sort of uh, the nexus of the mortgage crisis in 2007, and it's called an adjustable rate mortgage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where people would go buy, make a long-term investment, mm -hmm. but borrow money on a short-term basis, mm -hmm. meaning that their interest rate reset annually, or after a period of time, it would reset annually. Mm -hmm. And the, we've all seen the investment markets here recently where the Federal Reserve said that they are going to raise interest rates. Mm -hmm. They've raised interest rates three times already. Mm -hmm. They'll probably raise it again in December. So we know we're in an interest rate environment, mm -hmm. raise it rate, rate rising environment. Mm -hmm. We also know that interest rates are at historic all-time lows mm -hmm. and so my concern and I'd like to know how you would address this you suggest we borrow short-term and then lend it on a long-term basis which is what we would call in the industry a duration mis mismatch how would you address the risk by lending money long-term but borrowing it overnight knowing that those short-term rates are going to be rising the Federal Reserve said they're going to raise it seven more times in the next two years. So, um, well, the bonds that are callable between 2018 and 2023, they have terms that are from five to 15 years remaining on them, if I remember right. And so those are not particularly long-term. And I didn't look at how they were reconfigured because the way we did it was play around with uh, the term and the rate of interest to get the best uh, bang for the city but so in terms of refinancing debt that is um, that you know those are relatively short term and when we're talking about infrastructure we're not talking about big bond pro projects we're talking about things that are short term that are shovel ready that are like what you're looking to finance with a revolving loan fund but instead doing it with a bank and just having more capacity to do shorter term lending and then it's been suggested that the interest rate could be tied to the fed that's a lot of times what banks do but uh, definitely it should be short term um, or you know not really long term hi nicole um, hi. 
so there are uh, some things I'm not clear on, and I realized this was a model. Mm -hmm. So um, in it, and I'm looking at it from the operational side mm -hmm. of the bank. Um, the, from what I see on the salaries that you've included, pretty much upper management mm -hmm. as far as who we're accounting for. Mm -hmm. uh, don't know if the anticipation is partnering with another institution to do the more um, hourly, lower level uh, operational um, work, or if it was anticipated that this public bank would do it. If the public bank does it, then there's a, a, a significant number of salaries mm -hmm. that aren't accounted for, and I'm not asking you to. Mm -hmm. I'm just making a comment mm -hmm. that the, and that's what I spoke to earlier, is um, the, uh, the uh, non-obvious, if there's such a term, of the workforce are the are the the hourly the the data processors the the reconcilers the auditors the compliance team et cetera et cetera so there's a whole number of people that aren't accounted for in this and I wasn't sure if that was because you were thinking we would uh, the the concept was to work with another institution and use their workforce to do some of the work yeah and that is one of the things that we looked at was subcontracting and a lot of that is a lot of that kind of, and I think the city, uh, that is something the city might look at or does look at is subcontracting for credit card processing services. You don't need a big bank to do that. You could contract directly with a credit card processor, um, you know, uh, and, and you're right. So uh, when I, when, when on that statement, when you look at it, it says our year in balance, it doesn't say what our profit is mm -hmm. because we don't know what the hidden costs are. It's mm -hmm. when you take your car in to get it fixed and then you discover, you know, you right. need a valve job instead of a tune-up. So um, those are questions that we don't know. Okay. We also don't really um, have any kind of handle at all on regulatory requirements for a relatively simply structured bank mm -hmm. as opposed to um, I keep wanting to say beneficial bank instead of the one that David uses uh, altruistic bank because I think an altruistic bank would have all the regulatory requirements and expenses that our, our um, community banks are well, grounding you, under and you're right on, uh, on on the comment at the end of the day, whether it's a, um, a limited bank or it's a consumer bank, mm -hmm. um, there will be regulatory requirements based on what the function of the bank is. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what the function, there will be levels of regulatory oversight. Uh, even the subcontracting, if indeed that mm -hmm. were a model, mm -hmm. um, the regulatory view is if you are paying someone else to do right. it, you own their you're, problems. You're, you're doing the compliance. So you need to be building a staff just to oversee who you subcontracted with. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not expecting that you anticipated that. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of sound that out with you. We knew those yes. were questions, but we didn't know the answers to yeah. them. Okay. We're not regulators, but yep. you know we Absolutely. do have a couple of regulators on the task force force right. and um, so uh, you know it's just a model we want to show sure. you a possible a possible way forward and uh, being we call it a small hamster bank compared yeah. to other banks uh -huh. we actually would be smaller than any of the local community banks right. so um, the last comment I want to make then is to uh, other people had raised this question of you know what is the full model look like uh, and uh, this is a perfect segue as we further define what the bank will or won't do mm -hmm. then we can then extrapolate but as to what the other costs associated till we do that it's kind of hard to there's no to bank extrapolate in a box. there right there's no bank in a box for this right. kind of stuff and thank you for the work that you're doing it's I Really appreciate well, it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments for coming tonight, and thank the work for the for the brass tax for the oh, hard work that they put on you. Go ahead. We would like to meet with you. I have one question. Sure. Uh oh. One question before you go. <clears throat> I'm harping on liquidity again. Mm -hmm. um, on the balance sheet you referenced at the end of tab one, you're showing about 44 million in federal funds purchased and repos. Mm -hmm. 
the amount the amount of borrowing that one can do in the overnight market or in the repo market is going to be a function of what you have to repo mm -hmm. first of all and secondly it'll be limited to your your capital and surplus in terms of your overnight loan. I, I'm not going to be able to answer that question because I didn't do the noodling money to let, uh, you you couldn't get that much with the 10 million dollar or so capitalization that we're, we're discussing here so mm -hmm. and I'm the, still a little confused on that mm -hmm. um, so Say the question again so I can take it back. Well, if, if we assume a $10 million capitalization and you're looking to purchase $44 million in the overnight funds market mm -hmm. and or repurchase agreements, uh, that's not possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it would be helpful if you would point us um, to those ratios. Sure, I'd be happy. Because uh, I... Yeah. That would be helpful. No problem. We and we'd like to meet with you to understand better. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I want to move along a little bit. So, thanks so much for your help. Uh, next person. Uh, Burl Breckner, Santa Fe. Thank you. And I'll be five minutes and 15 seconds. <laughs> um, I have uh, four points I'd like to make. Uh, these are more generalized, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate the work you all are doing. Um, first, there's been a bias in favor of this project from the start. This goes back to at least September of 2014, when Mayor Gonzalez and Councilor Maestas were invited participants at a Banking on New Mexico symposium in Santa Fe, a group supporting the concept, and the group that includes the brass tax people who have just provided the information you have. That organization's president is now a member of the task force who, along with other members, were appointed by Mayor Gonzalez. At least five more of the eight public members had, before they were appointed, expressed interest in or involvement with the ideas of banking on New Mexico. Before the task force was created, a feasibility study, which cost the city $50,000, was done in part by an organization with which the mayor was involved. In fact, when it came to vote on the funding for that study, the mayor had to recuse himself from the vote. Is it a surprise then that this feasibility study supported the mayor's concept? Second, my second point, this project has moved along despite evidence that it was wrong and impractical for Santa Fe. A 2011 House Bill 290 to create a state of New Mexico public bank, bank went nowhere. Reports from state agencies made it so clear that this could not be done that the whole concept died in committee. An August memorandum from the State Regulations and Licensing Department concerning Santa Fe's proposal finds it impractical. And even more, the Virtue and Najara law firm, hired at some expense by the city, last month issued a 201-page report that cited dozens of issues suggesting creating a city public bank is anywhere from difficult to impossible to potentially illegal. It's no surprise there's one bank in the US, uh, one public bank in the US, the State Bank of North Dakota, created in 1919 under circumstances, times, rules, and needs vastly different from here and now in Santa Fe. Public bank supporters will tell you that the public bank idea is, quote, catching on, and cite several cities or states exploring the concept. Perhaps five or 10 years from now, if some state or a larger city has created a new public bank, Santa Fe can look at it as an example for consideration. But Santa Fe and its taxpayers should not be the guinea pig. And personally, as a taxpayer, I have no interest in being an investor through use of city tax collections in a public bank business scheme. If I want to be a stockholder in a bank, I want to make that choice myself. Uh, rather than the city putting taxpayer money into a risky and unproven experiment. Third, I fail to see any evidence that the city has seriously explored the negatives and risks of such a proposal. Has the city organized a gathering of commercial bankers, credit union people, or bank association representatives to explore the idea, to see whether better options exist without reinventing the wheel, to determine the reaction to a city that creates a bank in competition with local banking businesses? Has the city taken into account what the harm to the city, the taxpayers, 
might be if the bank fails or is closed due to fraud, loss, or mismanagement, what the impact on the reserves, city's reserves may be, what the impact on its bond rating may be. And up till now, as the task force looks more closely, I don't think the city really had a clue about the people and systems it would take to run a bank. I think it initially envisioned a bank staffed by a few people in a small city hall office annex somewhere, and that's impossibly naive and should have been apparent a lot earlier. And fourth and finally, Santa Fe has not proven it can or should assume the fiduciary responsibility of overseeing a bank. There have been problems with money handling at city parks programs, at rec centers, with collecting debts it is owed for services it has provided. Fraud and theft by city employees seems not uncommon, and the recent independent accountant study showed no noteworthy lapses of 60 or so areas of audit and financial management processes, issues that remain unresolved. Too frequently, financial plans for city projects prove off target and budgets are busted. A lot of citizens have, for now at least, lost confidence in this city to properly control spending or manage our money. This city is not an organization, in my view, that should be in control of establishing and overseeing a bank. This process has gone farther than it ever should have. There has been no widespread cry for a city-run bank. An organized group of advocates has pushed the city to where we are now. It's time that realities of the banking world and the city's limitations in terms of size and resources be recognized. It's time for the task force, the finance committee, and the governing body to end this process quickly and gracefully and move on to more pressing and manageable projects on behalf of Santa Fe's citizens. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Okay, listen, the uh, Bank of North Dakota was founded in 1919. It has returned a profit to the state of North Dakota every year since 1919. That's money that didn't go to Minneapolis bankers. It's money that didn't go to Wall Street. It's money that didn't go to global banks. It's money that went to the state of North Dakota. If we can establish a public bank in, um, in Santa Fe, we can, um, we can um, generate profits for the city. Regarding capitalization, has there, I read the, I read the subcommittee's brief report, um, would there be an opportunity for citizens to um, invest in their, in their public bank? Yes or no? No. Why not? I'm suggesting that there, that there might be citizens who would want to invest, provide capital for this public bank. You know, that, actually, that, that, that's a good idea. I thought throughout this process that what I'm hearing is a real hue and cry for a community bank, a private community bank in Santa Fe. And I think all the people that are of a like mind should get together, collect the capital, and open one. The public bank. Unrelated to the city. The public bank um, would have an opportunity as well to participate with community banks and projects that were beyond the scope of the community bank, correct? Yeah. As an opportunity to generate income and participation with community banks. I don't see the public banking being in competition and we don't need, a, I don't think we need another community bank. We need a public bank. We need a public bank that private uh, citizens could invest in to provide capital. I was. I in participation with the city. Uh, I mean, it, why does it have to be black or white? Why does it have to be just city uh, capitalization? Why can't it be a combination of capitalization from, from other sources? I, I, my sense is this. Um, the charter that we were given by the city council uh, asked us to investigate a bank owned by the city of Santa Fe, not the city of Santa Fe and others. I think that adding a layer of other investors while attractive in regard to maybe answering some of the capitalization questions, raises a number of other questions that we have not explored okay. about the relationship of um, that bank to its other investors, 
the duties that it owes to shareholders, how does it have to run things as a, as a, as a profit. And my sense, although I take your words seriously, and I will put this in some thoughts I have about what we might address to the Finance Committee, that the sense of what the Council was asking us was a bank owned by the City of Santa Fe. Gotcha. Thank you. If I, are, may, um, if I may address your yeah. question, too, from the Capitalization Committee's perspective, we've been assuming it would be a bank similar to the way North Dakota's bank is, is structured. And there, the relationship of the North Dakota bank to community banks is significant. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, we, if we decide to go ahead with a public bank, we would want to see what we could do to bring back more community banks. We only have one left. Uh, and three have gone out of existence within the last few years in Santa Fe, bought up by other banks. So what uh, the ratio of community banks to uh, population in North Dakota is about four times what it is in other parts of the United States. And the Bank of North Dakota has actually been a source of helping to uh, defray some of the regulatory requirements uh, that came out of the uh, 9-11 uh, Homeland Security re regulations and requirements, as well as the Dodd-Frank requirements around money laundering and cybersecurity, which are uh, one of the reasons why community banks nationwide are going out of existence so or being bought up. They can't afford the regulatory requirements. The Bank of North Dakota has helped pool them in a kind of a cooperative to address those questions, to hire the experts that are needed, and to share the costs. So I think it behooves us to look at, as uh, Randy was just suggesting, what kind of community banks do we want to have that would, would be from local stockholders, as well as a community bank that helps them thrive. Thank you for that background and update. Uh, when I moved to Santa Fe in um, 02, I think there were 75,000 people in the city and approximately 75,000, no, 65,000 in the city, 65,000 in the county. Wow, that's, that's not a lot of people to support. A, uh, have you looked at, um, at um, collaborating with the county? Um, 150,000 people in the city and the county might be, a, we might be able to get the economies of scale. Um, any thought given to that? Because 75,000 in the city. Again, um, interesting point. I think it was beyond the charter that was given us, which was to consider the pros and cons of a public bank for the city of Santa Fe. There's um, non-interest income. There's non-interest expense, there's interest income, there's interest expense um, to consider. And um, it seems to me we would want to look at um, um, the uh, city's RFPs to the global banks, if that's public um, information. Um, maybe the banks preclude it being public, but to see what services are actually being provided by those global banks to the city, there might be an opportunity for income for the public bank to step in and, and uh, provide some of those services. I'm just thinking, you know, in the, in the future. It's not just interest income and interest expense. It's, it's um, providing uh, goods and service, uh, services. Um, let's see, the other thought was, um, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, the, uh, the city just went through an RFP process. It is online. It's on the city's website. And I believe you can look at what the RFP was. Okay, um, it was in June this year. And then to your previous question, uh, we did pose that question to the, um, the attorneys, Virtue and that what would be the case of, and, and it was looked at, is the county, the city, the community college, and the school district. And the one comment that the attorneys did bring forward is that what is interesting about the city of Santa Fe is its home rule. Yeah. 
where the school district and the community college and I don't really sure on the county where they would sit and they wouldn't have the same regulatory questions on what they can do um, as a home rule city can. And so yes, that question was posed and uh, it was evaluated. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Appreciate your comments. And next. I really don't have anything more to add except to say to you all, thank you so much for the work that you're doing on this idea. Thank you to the brass tax team. Thank you to anyone who has looked into these ideas because no idea is stupid. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you much. What I thought I'd do is a quick cost-benefit analysis. Uh, starting with the costs, uh, the initial capital, uh, you're using a figure of $10 million. Uh, last meeting, you were using a figure of $20 million. Uh, I don't think that you've taken into consideration the peculiar nature of this and the fact that it may lead your regulators, like the FDIC, to insist on more capital. Uh, also, if you're talking about getting into lending, then you're going to need a whole nother bucket of money out there called the loan loss reserve, and uh, those are different things. Costs. Uh, to uh, start this up, to uh, buy the software, hardware, people, facility, and so on. At your last meeting, you were talking about a, a figure in the range of a million and a half. Now, maybe you can outsource, good idea, but uh, it's still, there's going to be a significant expense on the part of the city. Uh, then there's the issue of how much it's going to cost every year to operate it. Now, the figure that has been thrown around is a million dollars. Uh, I personally think that's a little high, but it's still going to be a significant expense in order for the city to use a uh, public bank. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the benefits that have been uh, mentioned all along. Uh, one is that it would improve the city's cash management and uh, would enable it to uh, better utilize and invest its own money. Uh, clearly, as the memo you mentioned uh, 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 indicated, that, that need has been met without need of a public bank. Uh, savings from prepaying bonds, loans, and so on. Undertaking capital improvements using uh, bank money. Well, the city is already doing that internally. So does it need to take money, put it in the bank, and borrow it right back? Uh, I question the need to do that. Uh, interest paid, 1% interest paid on the deposits. Uh, I'm not sure, going back to the point I raised earlier, that the uh, bank can afford to pay the city 1%, much less exceed the one and a quarter. And then there are other investment opportunities that the uh, city has, aside from a public bank. Uh, it's been said that the funds would stay local. Well, they would stay local at the moment that the city deposits into the public bank. But in order to, to collateralize the deposits, the public bank's going to have to invest in government-secured, uh, government-guaranteed instruments. So virtually all the deposited money is going to be tied up in, uh, in government instruments, and those are not local. Local community banks, on the other hand, if you deposit, say, $100, they will turn around and lend approximately $60, $70 of that out to uh, the local community. That is not what the public bank is going to be doing. Transparency. 
we will be exchanging a situation where we have elected officials on a finance committee with open meeting requirements, open uh, document uh, requirements, and so on, for a private bank board appointed by the city. Not necessarily open meetings. So, if anything, transparency will be considerably poorer with a public bank than it would be if the machinations are all within the city and the city's committees and so on. Uh, small business loans. It's been said that the public bank can do small business loans. It can, but the feasibility study, number one, said there's no need for that, no unmet need, and they strongly recommended that the public bank not undertake that. And on further, if you do that, then you go into this uh, issue of uh, loan loss reserve. Uh, lastly, it was uh, w a wish that we get out of Wells Fargo. Um, it might do that unless uh, you outsource certain services and end up back in the clutches of Wells Fargo again. So that's. Thank you. Any questions? Appreciate oh, one, one thing I'd like yes. to add. On the uh, thing that one of the speakers mentioned about borrowing from the Federal Reserve and the uh, Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, my past experience was that they lend against your mortgage portfolio. And the public bank would have no lo lo mortgage portfolio. So before you think about being able to uh, leverage the bank, you pr probably need to check and see about that. I know the bank I work for, every six months we were sent a letter as to what our legal lending limit was with the Federal Home Loan Bank and with the Federal Reserve, and they based it on their uh, underwriting our, loan, our mortgage loan portfolio. And then as we began to sell mortgages off, our lending limit went down. Thank you. I Questions? Have, I have a question, Lane. please. Yeah. I, I have a question for you. <coughs> You, you talked about costs, and then, you said, and then you said you were moving to benefit analysis, and I was listening carefully. What I think at that point is you were continuing to say the benefits that have been proposed about this wouldn't work, wouldn't work. I think that, that was the, the way you were dealing with the benefit analysis. And I'm curious about whether you have considered any benefit analysis that has not been mentioned by you yet and perhaps is harder to quantify. I, I don't understand your question. Okay. Uh, are you asking me, did I consider other benefits that I did not mention? Did you consider any benefits that, were not, that are not quantifiable? You've talked about interest rates and savings, et cetera. So it continued to be in the category of cost-benefit analysis that is quantifiable. And I wondered if there was anything else in your thinking about, about this that might be benefit analysis that is not quantifiable. That was not the uh, direction of my uh, little presentation here. Uh, I don't see any uh, other uh, intangible uh, benefits, really, that justify the expenditures that the city is looking at, at undertaking here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you much. Next. That's okay. My name is Neva von Pesky, and before I retired, I was an economist in the banking section of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, the task force needs to have accurate information about what a public bank can do. Unfortunately, some public bank supporters have made misleading claims about this. One that has been made often 
is the claim that a public bank can somehow expand the capital invested in it multiple times to provide credit to the community. The most recent example of this claim is a flyer put out by the brass tax team of banking on New Mexico. The flyer states, and I quote, a chartered public bank can leverage its core capital up to 10 times to issue bank credit, unquote. This is just flat out wrong. If the public bank wants to make loans, either to the public or to the city itself, it will have to make them out of funds deposited in the bank by the city, not by leveraging its core capital, whatever that means. I think this statement is based on confusion rather than a deliberate attempt to mislead. The confusion may spring from the fact that when a bank makes a loan, it commonly does so by creating a deposit for the borrower. But when the bank creates this deposit, it has to assume that it will be drawn down quickly because the borrower will write checks on it to pay for whatever he borrowed the money for. When those checks clear, the public bank will have to cover them by drawing down its other assets, for example, its own deposits at another bank. These other assets have to be available and they will have been acquired using the city's deposits in the public bank. Once you understand that credit can be extended by the public bank only out of money deposited by the city, not by some magical expansion created by leveraging its core capital, there is a real question whether a public bank can add anything useful to the cash management improvements made by the city's finance department. Thank you. Are there questions? Um, thank you for coming to all of our meetings. We had not heard from you before, but I really do appreciate um, the presentation you made this evening. I too want to start by thanking you for the hard work you've been putting in and thanking the brass, the brass tax group for the work it's been come putting in. And I'm not a banker, I'm not a financial expert, although 40 years ago I did write a doctoral dissertation on minority business enterprise and have continued an interest in the challenges to our minority business communities to obtain funding for their businesses. Uh, what appeals to me most about the possibility of a public bank falls in the area that you've addressed in terms of the question yet to be determined whether this is to be a, uh, a limited bank or what you've called an altruistic bank, uh, what Nico uh, referred to possibly as a beneficial bank and which I like to think of as a socially responsible bank in contrast to the global banks and most of the banking institutions in the country and the world. Uh, what I look for as most hopeful in having a public bank is the ability to cooperate with community banks and others uh, in ensuring that projects which would otherwise be unaddressed, whether they're infrastructure projects for the benefit of the community or uh, participation loans to support uh, minority business and other small business enterprises uh, and to deny our funds to the likes of Wells Fargo and find us funding fracking projects around the country. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any questions? Thanks for bearing with us at the time too. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, you all and many members of the public who have uh, contributed their expertise to this. And I'm sure that the current members of the council feel the same way because there's nobody on there that really has 
the kind of expertise that you're bringing to the table that some of the members of the public are bringing to the table. Um, but let me, so let me just briefly address two issues that have to do with, I guess, governance. One is something that was mentioned very briefly, mentioned a little more in the Journey Santa Fe talk uh, last Sunday, is there are limitations on city funds. And some people may think of these as silos, uh, but the reality is that statutorily they're put into silos. There are certain things you can use certain money for. There are certain things you can't use certain money for. It's one of the ma uh, maddling, frustrating things about uh, government budgetary uh, work that you know it, it isn't all just a big pile of money. It's a whole bunch of little piles of money. And you have to be careful about which one goes where. Secondly, there's still a lot of confusion um, in the public, and you've heard it tonight, about what is it that a public bank would do, starting at the level of um, it would help the city management its money. And you've heard comments tonight that maybe a bank isn't necessary to do that particular thing. But if the decision is made that that's what a public bank is needed for and you would have to make a strong argument for it, that's fine. Then you start working your way down the food chain. Is it intended to partner with local community banks? Is it intended to partner with NGOs? Is it intended to provide something to individuals? in the community. And as you go lower down on this food chain, you're running into higher risk and you're running into less surety. And given the lack of trust in city government handling money, which we've heard about tonight and have heard about a lot in the last year, um, you know, you want to have the highest level of uh, confidence in the public if you're going to have a public bank and if you're if you're getting into things that are more risky and have less surety that's just going to decrease the public trust I, I had one person who works for, for fairly high up in City Hall tell me that they thought what a public bank could do is buy up all the payday loans in the city and um, that the city would finance all of these payday loans at a lower rate, which would, you know, lower rate is great. And I said, well, what about um, loss ratios? And the response I got back is that working class people pay their debts. And I think most of the working class people really mean to pay their debts and really want to pay their debts, but we've seen enough ag examples in the last several years um, whether it's having homes foreclosed, whether it's, it's having uh, cars repossessed by uh, title lenders, by having uh, huge amounts of interest paid by uh, people in payday loans, there's a lot of risk involved there. And the city has to think about that risk as a government, just as, for instance, in economic development, um, we, you know, we can say we're going to, you know, fund these kinds of economic development, but we have to think about the potential risk. And um, you can have the best board in the world, but mistakes can be made, and the economy can change, and where is that going to leave the city? So as you, you know, as you think about what it is you want a public bank to do, Think about the potential um, positives, but think about the, certainly the potential negatives, which I haven't heard much discussion of tonight. Thank you. Thank you much, and appreciate your time and effort for the city and for us. Any questions? Anything on the floor? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, too. I'd like to express my thanks uh, for the intense um, and comprehensive work that you're doing on this project. Um, I was a part of the 
early on banking on New Mexico group. Um, I'm now in Albuquerque and advocating for some of the same work. Um, but I've stayed connected with and interested in progress here. Um, I want to raise a couple of questions related to what I heard, um, have heard tonight, and one is um, in the financial discussions, I'm not hearing a lot of attention paid to the cost of um, d actually obtaining bonds. Um, the research shows that that cost of the bond brokers and the fees that are being charged by the corporate banks are major. and. Um, I really uh, think that as we look at that, I think maybe brass tax has been considering that, but it's about, um, it is a part of the cost of doing business. So if those costs were lowered or minimized and those gains could be incorporated into a public bank, um, that does relate to where, where those additional funds for the public bank can um, come from or what can be netted out there and I so I just want to raise that point and also um, for me one of the primary interests all along has been how do we um, maintain or obtain more control over our revenues locally and to Ken Meyer's point not be supporting the funding of major projects that we may not that may not align with our values in other parts of the country but that are not supporting the local communities and so the local control that can come through the public banking and the initiatives whether it's infrastructure whether it's related to making a an intentional impact on affordable housing um, as was done in North Dakota, help regroup re from the recession, which they felt minimally um, in of 08, or major flooding, where they did quick um, rebuilding of communities along the rivers that were flooded. Um, I just want to raise that there are, there are opportunities there for local control and local enhancement that I just want to point out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments? Appreciate your coming up here from Albuquerque. Yes, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, there is some of our citizen team that I'd like to dispel the myth of right now. Mm. And that is the city, when it invested funds by statute, we invest in U.S. Treasuries, government agency debt. That is all that the statutes allow us to invest in. Our money is not going in. We are not investing our $160 million in Wells Fargo. We are precluded from investing in corporate paper. Okay. It's not by corporate bonds. The one investment that we can invest in is in pooled um, prime money market funds. And that is primarily, of the three I look at, um, you know, uh, we use BlackRock, Fidelity, and uh, JP Morgan. Okay. Which include commercial paper from typically their banks from across the world. So we're not investing in equities. Okay. We're not investing in any corporate paper specifically. No individual company bonds at all. It is strictly government and government agency and prime. <coughs> So there are no individual corporate bonds in there. Okay. I appreciate you clarifying that. Thank you. Other questions? Last speaker. All right. Well, let me say, um, oh, yes, sir. Uh, we do pay fees to Wells Fargo, and in our analysis, um, during we just did an RFP, um, and you will find that in the end, um, we pay very little fees at all, and that's because we are we earn a compensating balance on our um, assets held, or you know that are in the bank. 
So we pay very little fees to Wells Fargo. And two, when we do pay interest to our bondholders, that typically is Thornburg, uh, New Mexico tax exempt mutual fund, Vanguard, you know, Nuveen, um, insurance companies that buy our debt. Uh, we're not paying, we're paying our bondholders, people who take their money and invest in our community. They're earning a return on their investment. And our money doesn't stay deposited at Wells Fargo very oft long because it's moved into the Wells Fargo Trust Department and it is my job at the city as the cash and investment officer to go out and buy treasuries, agencies, or put it into the prime money market funds. <laughs> That's a bank question. Um, what do you mean by float? Uh, no, we we need more liquidity than that. We need way more liquidity than a million dollars. I mean, just every two weeks, payrolls, you know, roughly three and a half million. Yeah, if I could, I want to maintain some control here. So, uh, free questions, I'm not sure that I, I need people. So, let me take this one here, and then Nicole. Okay, and then we're going to close it up pretty soon. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thanks for all your hard work. It's Charlie Koenig. I'm a former Wells VP. What's the average ledger balance of the Wells Fargo deposits today? How many millions of dollars, or for, or for the month, what's the average ledger balance at Wells Fargo Bank? It's roughly 35 million. Thank you. And that's, and... Um, and we're earning a compensating balance on that, which right, more which than covers, covers our, our fees. More than covers our fees. And the accounts are collateralized. That is correct. Right. At, um, and at 102%. 102%. So those average ledger balances more than cover our, the fees that we, that we pay to Wells Fargo. So Wells Fargo gets the difference correct. between the value of those deposits and the fees that we pay. What would that be? I don't know I sent what out they're a, investing and I, I mean, if I'm getting one and a, you know, I'm getting one and a quarter on my prime funds, I think that would probably be a pretty good guess at what they're getting. They have better opportunities than the city has. They can invest in a much broader range of product. I sent out monthly statements to all my depositors. City and County of San Francisco, U.S. District Court. Those, those statements told them specifically what we charged for the services that we rendered and what the value was of those balances. So they knew, down to a dollar, the value of their, of their, um, their balances. And um, that information is available to you. The value of those deposits, you should get a statement from Wells Fargo every month that tells you, it's called a compensating balance statement. And um, what's the difference between, on a monthly basis, what we pay Wells Fargo and what the value of those deposits are? It's a real simple question, approximately. I don't look at that statement. I do know we have the compensating balance. It was part of the RFP, um, and I'm certain that um, it can be made available. I'll have to go look for it, but that's not something I do in my daily yeah, and, job. And if I can, okay, thank um, you. the questions are going a little bit beyond what the task force is here for this evening. Um, I appreciate the information is important, but books and records are not available to everybody at an instant at this desk. So. I think they'll take the questions under consideration, hopefully get you some answers. Nicole, did you still have something?
um, I, we did get the um, information from the Freedom of Information for Wells Fargo with the contract with the city of Santa Fe. We got it last spring. So I, I noticed this overnight bank account with the well with uh, the Cayman Islands. Can you tell me about that? Again, I'm not sure that these questions are within the scope okay. of why we're here this evening. Just curious. It's, it's a euro dollar. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank the audience for staying with us late this evening. Uh, clearly, there are a diversity of views among the citizens, and we appreciate from hearing all of them. It's important. I learned a lot of things this evening, and we will um, factor those questions in. Criticisms were fair, um, and we'll continue our work. Um, I think we have a public meeting next week on the 29th. Is that right? And then we have a meeting before the Finance Committee on the 5th of December, and those are open meetings. Anybody? The 4th of December. I'm sorry. The 4th of December. And those are open meetings, and you're all welcome to attend. So thanks again for your time, and I'll call this meeting to, uh, uh, to an end. Thank you all. Okay, yes, thank you. Oh, oh. Uh -oh. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh. All righty. There we go. All right. All right, so we have just two minutes to talk about because I want to get home. Um, we promised that we would try to put together a mini presentation from um, the bank. And um, Bob told me a couple of times he said, how are we going to go about it? Sorry, from outside Yeah, we, in the last meeting we had, we sort of said, yes, you know, we, we said we would do that. Yeah. sort of not push that issue. Maybe we should discuss that in our meeting next week and say, is that something that we'd like to do? Because they'll fly in, this fellow from Tokyo, and he'll come, but they've got an event. I guess I'm trying to reconcile
Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Did we do okay? Did we do okay? Good, good, good. I'm not running for office though or anything. I'm just <laughs> uh, good, good, good. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, you too, you too, you too. All right, take care, Liz. Yeah, yeah. And that may lead us to, 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 if we see that, then there's this trail of other YouTubers, and some are long and some are not so long. But there is an ability to do video research on that question. And I'll send you that one link that I have, and then we'll see where we go from there. So I, let's, I was just trying to, excuse me, just yeah. trying to reconcile our meetings going forward what we're describing here with the fact that about, this thing ain't going to happen. Now. Yeah, I know, I know. And, and how, do we, how do we conduct the meetings? There are a lot of... Well, statements I would have made here that I didn't because I thought it was way too negative. And I thought that's fine. Thought you know, how, how do we, uh, but we, we, need to, we need to push forward. Well, I think we have to get past the Finance Committee, right? And I think what I want to hear from the Finance Committee is, one, this is what we've done. We've done a lot of good work. We hope this is what you thought we were going to do. But if there's something that we really missed, you better tell us. Right. Two, on this question of the business plan, I don't think I have the expertise, and I don't think, I know I don't have the money to get the expertise. So if you really want us to do a business plan, you got to get us money that they won't have. Uh, the aren't plan. they going to ask about our recommendation to date? On how are you weighing it, guys? Uh, well, the no, third thing I have to ask them is, are you asking us for a recommendation? Yeah. Because in one place your resolution says you are, and in another place you say you want to report on the pluses and minuses. I'll tell you the pluses and minuses, but if you want a recommendation, you got to tell me that that's what you were asking. Right. 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 So right. that's so after I can clear up a bunch of those things, I think that um, maybe we can figure out where we go. Well, here's the challenge. Yeah. You want pluses and minuses, but we still don't know what we're giving you pluses and minuses. Yeah. That's you know. the biggest problem. Well, I, I I don't know how to pull that out of my hat. I know. don't either. And that's what I was just telling you. I think we still heard tonight a variety of people of thinking course. different things. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, so okay. All right. Well, I'm all right. You, you might join this group because 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 we um <laughs> didn't we didn't include you because I think you were still away. We're sort of past with coming up with. Uh, oh, the place. Oh, Hi, Christina. Hi. How are you doing? Oh, I'm just back. Oh, a banker's presentation. But that a couple of bankers will oh, come oh, to the task force and say, oh, we want your thing. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the three of us are trying to think of names. You might not have names I don't know locals. Here. Oh, yeah. I don't but know. maybe I'll include you in that those discussions. I'd love to be part of it. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to be part of it. Okay, i got to get home. All right. Uh, All right, good to see everyone. Brad, thanks so much. Nicely done. Yeah. Elaine, thank you. I'll just forget. You uh, yeah. So where are we? Um, I think we're thinking of names. I think I'm going to try to talk to Michelle when she's better. And I think I'm going to try to put it together for the meeting after the next meeting. But we got to figure out some names. And if you have bankers' names, also get me bankers' names. So beyond McGonagall, who will work. Well, I'd like them to address who are they, what is, you know, how do they relate to our banking community? What is their experience in regard to banking the city and or banking the community generally? And what do they think about a public bank? I think there are some 
more specific question that I'd like to hear for you, such as what is the structure of a public forum? That was either it'd be too expensive for the community to have a scale or it could Right. I think that's good too. So let's mock all these down and we'll keep working on it. All right, thank you all. All right. I'm going home. I think I think we got good input today. I think I we got good so. input. I, I'm going to have to sit with my notes now. <laughs> I wanted some, some things we didn't get, but uh, all right, well, well, it's not that we didn't give everybody a chance to speak, right? Okay. And we didn't cut, really cut anybody off and say another thing. So. I agree. Yeah. You keep doing that. <laughs> I didn't do that other one. Is that a comment on city government? <laughs> I can't hear very well from here, so do you want to go somewhere and have uh, talks with us? No, but I think that's actually the right Let's do that. I'm going to just tell you that if you want to make some stuff, then I will uh, we'll figure out where. Okay.
question is, is you know, what differentiates that is you can have where you can you can have the joint uh, the bank. Sure. And and I think there's some way of writing that that gives that as long as you get the infrastructure to the right time. Sure, no, I, I think that's right. I understood that. But there's also a 